Hi everyone, this is Jim. Uh, I'm a product marketing director with Sneak and I want to thank you for joining me on this session today. Uh, the session is, your container has vulnerabilities, now what? And so I'm going to do some demos and I'm going to talk about a process that you can use to get vulnerabilities out of your container. So uh, I'll get to that in just a second. But before I get to that, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about, a little bit about Sneak and Docker together. Uh, hopefully you saw the news last week. Uh, if you missed it, uh, Docker and Sneak announced that they're forming a new partnership uh, to add security directly to, uh, to Docker. So you'll be able to scan your container images uh, and uh, from your desktop and, and Docker Hub and those sorts of things using Sneak uh, to do that. So we're really excited about this uh, from the Sneak side. I know talking to my former colleagues, I used to work for Docker and have a lot of friends there still and talking to them, they're really excited about this as well. Um, their roadmap, the Docker roadmap is public and it's been one of their, you know, their hot topics on their roadmap. And so we're really excited to be bringing these two things uh, together. Uh, we've seen a lot of excitement from the community as well. So, uh, so look for that coming in the very, very near future. And what you'll see in the demos today will be the types of things you can do when we combine these two things. But you'll be able to do it straight from Docker uh, instead of using some of the sneak commands that I'm going to show you today. So we'll get to see a little bit of that. Uh, so I'm really excited about it. Uh, so as I said, there will be demos. I'm going to do this live. I'll show you a couple of different containers and we're going to go through uh, and fix those up. Uh, all of those containers and this material is all available to you as well. So I'll show you the, the, the GitHub repo where you can grab these things if you want to walk through the process uh, yourself and you can get Sneak for free uh, and, and you can use it to run application tests and, and container tests and, and other things too. So, uh, so I encourage you to do that um, after after today. So I want to give you a little bit of a background on what Sneak does before I get into the demos because we have this partnership with Docker. Uh, and so I want to give you a bit of a background on the kinds of things that you'll see when we bring these two products together. Now, if, to start with, we need to think about a little bit about what an application is today. Your code is an obvious part of it, but your code often has a lot of open source dependencies in it as well. Uh, and so that significantly expands what we talk about when we say your code. Uh, that code is ending up in a container for everybody that's here today at DockerCon, that's probably true. But even for people that are not, by and large, more and more of these applications are ending up inside of a container. And then that container runs somewhere, usually with a bunch of other containers, and you have something like Kubernetes, uh, or you know, there's a, lots of other options, but Kubernetes is tending to win uh, in terms of where people are running these things. And there's configuration that goes with that. All of this, I would suggest, is the application. All of this is needed for that piece of code that you've written to make its way into production. All of it is tends to be owned by somebody who is a developer. Maybe it's not the same developer for all of these, uh, but more and more it is. And uh, e even if it's not, it's still a developer type person. Goes through you know, code reviews and CI processes and all those sorts of things. And all of these things need their own uh, security checks on them as well. Uh, and so that's what Sneak does. Sneak helps you secure this entire stack of things. When it comes to your code, we scan for the open source dependencies that you're pulling in. We'll scan all of those for vulnerabilities and the license and copyright information. Really focused on helping you fix those things as well. So not just presenting a list of vulnerabilities, but automating how you can fix those things directly. And we'll see that in the demo. Same idea with containers. So we do scan the container image. We do give you a list of the vulnerabilities, but we can also use things like the Docker file and integrate that into our scanning. And we'll show you base images and what you can do with the base image to make a better image and what you can do with the layers that you've added um, and where you might be introducing vulnerabilities there. So again, that fits very neatly into the process that we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. And then, Finally, there's the services configuration. So whether you're using Kubernetes or something else, right? Um, those are things that need to be scanned. And, and Sneak has recently added a capability of scanning those Kubernetes configuration files. And we'll take a look at that real briefly in the demo as well. All of this is backed up by our intelligence uh, and security service. So we do our own security research. We, of course, get vulnerabilities from, you know, from the community. But we also contribute back to the community with the research that we do. We add a lot of information to, you know, to the open uh, community of vulnerabilities. So in terms of you know, even things like providing an explanation for what a vulnerability is that might make more sense to a developer as opposed to just the raw CVE information that's there for um, 
you know, for security purposes. So that's a bit of a background on Sneak, a really fast one, uh, but I do want to save plenty of time for us to do the actual demos, which is probably why most of you are here. All right, as I said before, the, the real focus here is the approach for cleaning up vulnerabilities uh, and how you can go through that <clears throat> in a systematic way to get vulnerabilities out of your, your containers. And so it's really a, a simple four-step approach to it. Um, we start with the code dependencies. Those are the things that you control the most directly, things that you probably work on every day. Uh, and so those are things that can be checked early and often. And you know by the time they get into a container, they should be as clean as possible. We'll start with that. We'll see a little bit of that in the demo. It's not you know the, the main focus of the demo, but we'll see a little bit of it. Um, you should also look at your base images, uh, and that's a big part of it when it comes to containers. If you if you follow any of the container uh, best practices, image best practices, Dockerfile best practices uh, sessions from this DockerCon or from any of the previous DockerCons or, or in articles that you see in those types of places, they'll tell you choose a slim uh, base image and then add what you need to it as opposed to an image that's that's thicker and might have everything you need by default. Those thicker images tend to have a lot of other stuff that you don't need as a real implication for the number of vulnerabilities that you deal with uh, all the time. So dealing with that base image is really important. Then the stuff you add to the container, your own layers uh, and your own tools and libraries and those sorts of things that you put into a container, those are gonna bring uh, extra dependencies and vulnerabilities with them as well. And those are things that you need to deal with too. And then finally, there's that configuration. How does this thing actually run when I launch it and, and deploy it? Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll look at that a little bit uh, in here as well as it relates to Kubernetes configurations. Okay, with our process in mind, now let's actually get into the demo. So we've got two of them. Uh, the first one's a really short and simple demo uh, just to get you used to the process and kind of introduce how this is gonna work. But we have an Alpine container that runs curl. That's really all that it does. It's a very simple little utility container, but it does show some nice uh, some nice things as far as this process goes. So we have a, a Docker file here. I'll show you so you understand how this container is built. It's Alpine. Uh, it's Alpine 3.7 in this particular case. Then we add Add curl and it runs curl. It's all that the thing really does, and we can actually see the uh, the uh, the image here. Uh, so it's this three seven original uh, that that we're interested in, right? So this is my starting container. You'll notice here it's two years old, uh, and and so. Uh, we'll take a look at what that means. But this this type of stuff is very normal. We have containers and it runs just fine, uh, but it's two years old. So let's do a quick test on it. So I'm gonna run a test on my container. And as I said before, I'm using Sneak today to do that. So we'll do a Sneak test, all right. Uh, and then I've got a Docker file. So I'm gonna he hook up my Docker file to this. So the, uh, adding the Docker file gives us some additional resolution when we go and search for vulnerabilities. It helps us relate vulnerabilities back to a particular instruction in the Docker file. It also helps us figure out exactly what your base image is and do some, do some analysis there. So the test ran really quickly uh, and we've already got our results back. Uh, and you'll notice here probably the things in red stick out the most. Uh, we found 21 issues in this container. If we go up and look at some of the particular issues that we'll found that are found, it tells us exactly what line in the Docker file introduced these issues. So this is in the user layer. The ten, that's actually step three. Remember, we had a four steps. Step one was the code. We don't have any code here, so we're not going to worry about that. Step two was the base image. We're going to focus on that. Step three is the user layer instructions. I'm going to do that in a minute. Uh, but if we scroll up a little bit, we'll see some, you know, if there's a bunch of vulnerabilities that were introduced by our base image as well. So we're going to deal with those first. Now, I do think it's important to point something out here. Like you'll see these vulnerabilities, for instance, that are in live SSH2. And a lot of times when you scan, I've seen a lot of tools that will produce this list of vulnerabilities, but they don't really tell you where the vulnerability comes from. And it's important, I think, to know that because um, it's important to know where the vulnerability comes from because if it's in the base image, you don't go just patching the base image willy-nilly. The base image is maintained by somebody else. In this case, and in a lot of cases, it's maintained by Docker. We're grabbing Alpine from Docker. We're grabbing other things from Docker, and we build upon those. That's the great thing about containers. So I don't maintain the Alpine image. Therefore, uh, for me to start patching it, could lead to other problems later in terms of maintenance of everything. And I don't want to be in the operating 
operating system maintenance game. So getting a long list of vulnerabilities without being able to tell the difference between a base image vulnerability and user layer vulnerabilities makes it hard to fix these things. Uh, but fortunately, we have that here uh, and we can focus on what's in the base image. Now, the other thing you'll notice here, this is something that Sneak does that's, uh, that I think is kind of neat, is we'll tell you that this version of Alpine that we're using is not supported anymore. So it's, you know, the Alpine organization that maintains Alpine doesn't support Alpine 3.7 anymore. So as we address this base image, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it also tells us that our base image is out of date. So it, yes, it's out of support, but there is a newer version of Alpine 3.7 that's available from Docker. So I could rebuild this container just using the existing Docker file, and I'll get a newer version, a newer, uh, you know, a version of, of Alpine 3.7 as the base image, and that could potentially fix a lot of these issues for me. But if I'm going to update it anyway, I might as well update it to something that's that's actually supported. So I'll do that instead. So I'm just going to edit the Docker file here. Oops, I need to edit. And I'm going to change it from Alpine 3.7 to Alpine 3.10. Okay. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do right now. As I said, we'll address the curl vulnerabilities uh, in a second, but let's, let's deal with the base image first. So let's go ahead and build it. Um, we'll just call this my curl 02. And the Docker file is here, so we should be good. Let's try building that. Should build pretty quick. It's Alpine, uh, and yep, yeah, it built built really fast. Um, and so there it is. I could run it if I wanted to. If you want to really want to see what it does, it does curl. It's not anything special, right? So there we go. That works. But more importantly, let's see where we are from a vulnerability standpoint. So we'll do another sneak test on it. Same way we did before, but with our updated image, we've updated the Docker file, so there's some new info in there as well. So we'll scan it and we get back our results and good, we're in good shape. We have updated this to Alpine 3.10 and by doing that, we also got those user layer vulnerabilities taken care of. Now, that's because we rebuilt this image, we built it on a new base image and as we did that, we also built uh, and, and pulled in the latest versions of curl along with that. So when we, when we updated it, we got new curl uh, with it as a bonus and so now I've dealt with layers two or steps two and three in our process, all from just updating that base image. So that's a really simple, simple example. Our next example is not quite as simple, uh, and so we'll, but it is a little bit more realistic. So we'll take a look at a little bit more complex case where we have to actually deal with some code in the second example. Okay, so let's talk about our second example here. So as I said, it's a little bit more of a real world type example. This is an actual container with code in it. In this case, it happens to be a Ruby on Rails project, uh, but don't worry if you're not a Ruby uh, expert, it doesn't really make a difference. We're not gonna do a whole lot of Ruby anything here today, but it does have some implications on how we think about upgrading uh, upgrading containers. When we're dealing with vulnerabilities, sometimes we wanna you know change what types of containers we're using, and that can have effects on our code. So we'll take a little bit of a look at that. We did install some tools into it. So we have Git, and Vim inside our container as well. And we'll deal with that when we get to the third step of our process. And then we have Kubernetes files with this as well. So this will run on Kubernetes and we're gonna deal a little bit with the configuration. We'll at least take a look at that uh, at the end here. Um, so let's, um, let's get into it. First thing I wanna show you is that this is in fact a real uh, application. Uh, maybe not something you would run really in production, but it is an application. So this, this little blog uh, type application, let's get to the code part of it here we can look at what we actually have here. So we have a Docker file, we have a gem file and things that go with Ruby and it's set up the way that Rails wants things set up. Now, I could, as step one of our process, right, is to deal with the code vulnerabilities. And I could do a sneak test uh, from here and uh, have it go and search through all the different directories and recursively find all the different open source manifest files, uh, then tell me all the vulnerabilities. And it will do that for me right here. And that would work locally for me. I could do that on the fly. I could do that as part of a CI process, but something a little more interesting, I think, is to see it happen in the console. Because as I said, I wanna actually fix these vulnerabilities. And while I could do that, here, 
um, it's a little more fun to let Sneak do it for me because it's less work for me. Um, and so what I've done is I've imported this same code via GitHub. I can do that by just simply adding a project. You see GitHub and GitLab here, but we could use Bitbucket and other sources. You can see it's found when it did the import, it found the gem file manifest, so that's there. It also found the Kubernetes file, so it's already done a scan on the Kubernetes files. I said, that's step four, we'll come back to it. But let's take a look at what it finds here in terms of the code. So we have uh, a number of vulnerabilities that exist in the open source dependencies that we've pulled in. Um, there's exploit maturity. So I can see I've got one. One of these vulnerabilities actually has a proof of concept exploit for it as well. And because I have it here, if there's new vulnerabilities tomorrow, this can also alert me when those things pop up. But What's really cool and really fun and really great for me as somebody who doesn't want to suss through all these different vulnerabilities and the dependencies is I can just do a fixed PR from here as well. And essentially what that does is goes back to GitHub and opens a pull request for me that will fix all of these issues that it's got listed here. Uh, there's two that don't happen to have a fix right now, but they're not high risk or high severity vulnerabilities. So I'm gonna not worry about those and I'll click the open fix PR and I'll let Sneak go and take care of it for me. Okay, and so it's taken me now, it's taken me back to GitHub and the fixed PR is open for me. We'll merge that on in there. I'll go back to my terminal and we'll pull down those, uh, those changes, All right? So we've now dealt with step one, which was to check our code and make sure that our code is fixed. And Sneak actually did that for us. So that's a nice advantage uh, of using Sneak to do this is that those fixes were done, uh, done for us rather than me going through and manually doing these. Now, let's take a look at step two, which is our Docker file. So let's take a look at the Docker file that we're starting with here. Uh, so this is what's currently running the blog. It's running on Ruby 251. Here you can see we're installing get and vim as we talked about. We're going to come back to that as part of step three. Now let's do a sneak test on uh, on the image that we're using here. Um, so first of all, you notice here we have 826 issues. That's far more than we had before. And it has to do with the fact that we're using this sort of thick Ruby image to start with. That makes it really simple from a development perspective because everything I need is already there and I don't have to worry about it, but it's not good from a best practices perspective. And from a security perspective, when we're dealing with vulnerabilities, there's a load of them to deal with. We can see 823 of those vulnerabilities, 42 of which are high severity vulnerabilities, come from that Ruby base image that we're using. Now Sneak um, will tell me some recommendations for how to upgrade the base image, right? So I can just upgrade to the Ruby 2.5 image and it'll go from 823 to 281 vulnerabilities. So that's a significant uh, decrease, but even more significant, I get one, just one high severity as opposed to 42. Look at down at these, what we call alternative base images, right? We call these alternatives because they do require a little more thinking and maybe a little more effort. This is using Ruby 2.6. This one's using Ruby 2.7. Um, and on top of that, they're also slim images. So we've taken out a lot of the extra operating system bits to slim down the images. Uh, when I say we, what I really mean is Docker has taken out a lot of those extra bits. And so there's, uh, there's only 54 vulnerabilities if I go to this Ruby 2.7.0, which is the latest version of Ruby. And uh, by going to the slim, I get down to 54 with zero high severity vulnerabilities. But it does have an impact on how my uh, application works. So let me show you real fast, um, just so you can see that. If you're a Ruby developer, you can probably guess what's going to happen here. Um, but uh, if you haven't seen this before, we'll just do it. We'll, so we'll just make a real simple change. We'll do a Docker build. Uh, I'm not even gonna bother tagging it because it doesn't really make a difference um, because this will fail pretty quickly. And the reason it fails is because we, we did change the Ruby version, right? Knowing Ruby even as well as I do, and I don't do Ruby code day to day, it's fairly obvious to me what should be fixed. And if you're a day-to-day -day developer of Ruby or of Python or, or 
or, or Perl or PHP or whatever your Java, whatever your language of choice is, you'll know where those, you know, let those version dependencies and things lie and what needs to get fixed. So there's, um, there's a Docker file that I've got here where I've already made those changes. So you can see here in this Ruby fixes Docker file, I'm still using the 270 slim buster. I still got, I still have Git and Vim in here. Down here is where I changed some of the versions, right? So again, not, not important to understand the details, but I did match those versions to what's inside the container. Um, and then I have to update my code to match those as well. And then because I'm using the slim image, I had to add these developer libraries back in. This is so that my gems can build um, and my code will actually run uh, that way, right? Again, the slim image takes all that stuff out. So I get rid of a lot of vulnerabilities, but then I have to figure out which things I actually need for building my gems. And it, again, it wasn't, wasn't terribly hard to figure that out. Now I should be able to, uh, to build this thing. Uh, let's see, that's it, alpha blog 270. We're gonna use the Ruby fixes Docker file and we'll let this build. Now, just to let you know, uh, when uh, uh, a Ruby uh, uh, application builds uh, via Docker, we have to build all those gems. That takes like five minutes. So rather than sitting here watching it, because we're uh, using the miracle of recorded technology, I'm going to zap forward to the end of this where it's already done building. Okay, now that is built for us. You can see it took approximately five minutes to uh, to build that image for us. And let's do a sneak test on this thing again. Actually, I'll show you the sneak test uh, a slightly different way. So again, um, I did a sneak test on this one um, in the console. So I, what I did was a sneak monitor. So you can do instead of sneak test, do a sneak monitor here. And what it will do is take a snapshot of the image and what it, what we need from the image, send that back to that same sneak console we saw before. And um, and by doing so, we do two things. One, we get the test results, so we know what the status is of the image, but also now we have that image available to us. So whenever new vulnerabilities are discovered, same thing we talked about with the code, we can get, um, we can get updates and get alerts on the fact that there's a new vulnerability that affects this particular image. So here is the actual image um, that we built. Um, you can see here, zero uh, high severity vulnerabilities. Um, there's still some mediums and lows. We'll deal with a couple of those here in just a second. Um, but same type of information we saw from the command line. Again, looks a little bit different than the code, but same type of information. We do have a base image upgrade recommendation because we can get rid of a few vulnerabilities, but I'm not gonna do that. I, for me, for personal reasons, I wouldn't do that because it's just Ruby 2, and I would rather have it say it's Ruby 2.7 or some more specific version than Ruby 2, and to get rid of four vulnerabilities, it doesn't seem worth it to me. Um, but the, again, all the dependency information, the Docker file instructions that introduced vulnerabilities, all that kind of stuff is here. If I want to, uh, because this is a container, I can actually separate out uh, base image vulnerabilities from user instruction vulnerabilities. If I want to search for this, I can search for things just related to Git or to Vim, which are two utilities that we have in here. So we see that there are a few vulnerabilities related to those. And we said that was going to be our step three. So step one, we got rid of the code. Step two, we fixed our base image. We're down down to zero high severity vulnerabilities uh, and really only 54 vulnerabilities that are related to our base image at all. Um, and now we have some that are related to the tools that we've added in to our container. So let's deal with those really, really quick um, and talk about some of that process. Uh, let's edit our Docker file. And let's talk about a couple things here. So while I'm gonna just remove Git and Vim, those are pretty simple because I don't use them anymore. Like I said, I'm using Docker Desktop now to do my development and just mounting the code uh, as opposed to you know bundling it as part of the container. So I don't need those two utilities, remove those, that'll get rid of some vulnerabilities. Let's talk about all these development libraries. I can't remove them immediately because I need them to actually get my dependencies installed. They have to be uh, compiled and installed and I need these libraries in order to do that. But if you're familiar uh, with Docker best practices, right, you may be familiar with multi-stage builds. If you're not familiar with them, you should be familiar with multi-stage builds. So go find one of the sessions here at DockerCon that talks about multi-stage builds and watch it. 
Uh, but what you could do is a multi-stage build. So we do the exact same thing we're doing here that would build all the Ruby gems and get them into this first container for us. And then what we'd essentially do is have a second container, just copy the final gems over and, uh, and, and our code, and we would run it that way. And that would get rid of these development binaries. I'm working on that. As a matter of fact, we, we are not going to see it here. Uh, but if you do pull down this repository that's below my face uh, and you want to go through the exercises yourself, there's a multi-stage branch and I'm working on the multi-stage Docker file for that. Now that's a little bit specific to Ruby, but the process again is the same no matter what your language is. And you'll find articles that tell you, you know, for Java or for you know, Python or whatever your language of choice is, how to do a multi-stage build with it. But that should be good. We'll get rid of um, Git and Vim. Let's do one more Docker build. Um, we're going to call this one no git. We'll use our, our new Ruby fixes Docker file. And just the same as before, this takes a few minutes. So we'll, uh, we'll time warp to the end of that. Okay, so that is now finished uh, building as well. Uh, let's do one final sneak test here. And uh, yep, that's it. That's our no git. And let's see the, the final result that we have here. Okay, so here we are. So we've got, uh, we've, we've taken three steps of our process now. So we have, uh, we have effectively, we've removed uh, the code vulnerabilities. We've removed the uh, base image, as many uh, vulnerabilities as we wanna deal with, uh, all the high severities. Uh, we've now removed things like Git and Vim and things that affect our user layers. We talked about how to remove those libraries as well, but it's a little more advanced, so we won't deal with that today. We've got down to 129 issues now, uh, and none of them are high severity. As you can see uh, by looking up here, most of them are related to those developer libraries that we have here. So if we remove those, if we do that multi-stage build, we'll get rid of far more vulnerabilities and we should effectively get down to pretty close to um, this, this 54 number. Um, and so we've talked about those things. The last thing we wanted to talk about was, uh, was the configuration. And I said I'd show you what Sneak does um, in terms of in terms of helping you with that configuration. So just very quickly, remember when we looked at the repository we imported from GitHub, we had a Kubernetes file here. And uh, this is our deployment file for Kubernetes. And we flagged several issues in this file that we could implement that would make our deployment more secure as well. And these are things that you don't all this you don't usually see when you look at Kubernetes examples and you start learning Kubernetes, they're not always in there unless you're looking very specifically for security um, for security settings. Uh, but there are things that probably should be in a Kubernetes file to make your application more secure. So we flag these things. We have the YAML over here on the right side. And then we have the issues. We've collapsed a lot of the YAML because it does, it's not affected to make it a little bit easier to view. But you can see here, this container is running as root. There's nothing, there is a setting we could use from Kubernetes that would prevent that uh, from happening, but we have not included that in our YAML, so that's been flagged. Several other things that follow in the, those uh, along similar lines. None of these things are vulnerabilities in and of themselves, but they are things that we could do to lock down how this application runs. They would also prevent if somebody does take advantage of, uh, of a vulnerability in our container or finds a way to get into our container, that we can limit what they can do by using all of these types of settings. So again, all designed to help you as the person who has to maintain these things, uh, understand what the security implications are and design to get you to a point where you can fix those things very easily, okay? All right, so those are uh, my demos. Um, so as I said uh, in, in the demo, you can go to Sneak.io, you can sign up for free um, and you can actually start using Sneak for free. So you can run uh, tests on your code, your containers, your Kubernetes files, all those kinds of things. If you wanna see uh, a more customized demo and ask us questions and, and those sorts of things. First of all, w uh, there's several of us that are here today. Uh, you can ask questions in the, uh, in the chat panel. Uh, and I've got myself and, and several others that are here to help answer questions uh, throughout uh, DockerCon as well, uh, but you can sign up at sneak.io uh, slash sign up and look for news about the uh, the Docker relationship coming very, very soon. Um, so those products will start shipping uh, here this summer. And so we're really excited about those uh, those as well. 
All right. With that, I want to say thank you. Uh, enjoy everything else uh, that this DockerCon Live uh, has to offer. Uh, and again, if you want to ask us questions, we're uh, me and, and several uh, really smart folks from Sneak, uh, far smarter than myself, are available and able to answer those questions. Go ahead and ask them in the in the chat panel. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the session, and uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of DockerCon.